Krishna. I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you. This beautiful temple and this beautiful natural background. It is truly up to the name. Go look Rindavan, you feel it must be something like this. <laughs> so it's great to all the wonderful things here that by Srila Prabhupada's mercy, uh, he has manifested replicas of the spiritual world in different parts of the world. So I'll speak today on the topic of uh, resolutions in the three modes and in transcendence. <coughs> last year, or uh, last in 2017, at the start of it, I was invited to a TV talk show in India on the topic of New Year resolutions. And that time I did some research and I found that 90% of the resolutions, that the New Year resolutions that people make, 90% of the New Year resolutions are not new. <laughs> <laughs> so there were resolutions which were made in the previous year, but somehow you couldn't keep them. So now we make them again. So making resolutions is an expression of the natural human sentiment that we all want to have a better life. We all want to improve ourselves. And in some cases, we know what we need to do to improve ourselves. In some cases, we need to find out what we need to do. But something seems to sabotage our resolutions. So if we conceive our resolution to be like a plane, the plane takes off with great speed, but before reaching the destination, it crash lands. So the resolution starts off with great enthusiasm, but somehow we don't sustain it. So I'll talk today about what it is that causes us, uh, uh, prevents our intention from transforming into action and what we can do about it. So the Bhagavad Gita explains human behavior and indeed all of nature in terms of the three modes. The three modes are subtle forces that shape the interaction between matter and consciousness. So matter is the world out there, consciousness is we souls. Now how we respond to the world out there, that is shaped by the modes we are in. A simple example, say somebody say people are watching a movie in a theater and suddenly a fire breaks out. When the fire breaks out at that time usually there is a stampede. Everybody tries to rush to the nearest door to get out and many times when accidents happen in crowded places the accident does not cause as much casualties as the stampede involved because of the accident. So we can consider three kinds of people. Some people just rush to the nearest door and they fall over each other, they push each other, there's a stampede. Some other people who just become petrified, fire, just don't know what to do. And there's a third category of people who think, oh fire, where is the fire extinguisher? And everybody is going towards the nearest door, they go in the other direction where the fire extinguisher is, they go there and they extinguish the fire. So now these three, three, three kinds of people, what do they represent? The person who tries to run immediately, that is passion, yes, Rajoguna. Person who becomes petrified, ignorance. ignorance. And the person who looks for a fire extinguisher, goodness. Yes. goodness. So now we intuitively understand this, but to put it in more analytical terms, we could say that our interaction with the world has two aspects. There is contemplation of what I should do and then there is action. So in the Bhagavad Gita in the 14th chapter uh, where Krishna talks about the three modes of material nature, there he talks about their characteristics in 14.11, 12, 13. He talks about it, but let's look at these three verses. In 14.11 he says, Sarvadware shude hesmin prakasha upajayate Jnanam yada tada vidyad vivruddham sattva mityuta. So when the mode of goodness is prominent, at that time, the doors of the body, that is the senses, they are illumined. Illumined with knowledge. 
that means we understand what to speak what not to speak what to look at what to not look at what to do what not to do this understanding that is there that is characteristic of the mode of goodness so we could say in the mode of goodness there is contemplation before action so somebody makes me very angry and i feel like blasting out at them or i feel like physically hitting them also but before the action there is contemplation so there is a prakash you know, if the door he said if this door is dark over here then who is coming in who is going out i will not be able to see and say a child may slip out and go into danger or a thief may come in and put me in danger but if the door is illumined then i can check what who should be allowed in who should be allowed to go out so in the mode of goodness there is illumination so illumination ensures that there is first contemplation there is then action in the mode of passion lobha pravrittir aramba karmana masham aspruha rajasyetani jayante vivruddhe bharata rishabha krishna says there is greed and insatiable desire and a strong craving for action to do something and do something immediately so that is the characteristic of the mode of passion so we could say conversely we have first contemplation first action then contemplation oh, i shouldn't i do something what is the right thing to do just run wherever there is a exit and then was it necessary to run like that so we could say in contemporary terminology look before you leap that would be action in the mode of goodness and we have this shoe company just do it <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that is the mode of passion just do it hmm? whereas if we have the mode of ignorance krishna says aprakasho apravrittischa pramado moha evacha tamasye tani jayante vivruddhe kuru nandana so prakasha his illumination is the characteristic of goodness and action pravrutti is the characteristic of the mode of passion but here he says with respect to the ignorance there is a prakasha and a pravrutti there is neither illumination nor action then what is there moha there is simply delusion so the person just doesn't think what should i do doesn't petrified fire fire will burn me this will happen that will happen it just imagination just delusion nothing is there. so neither action nor contemplation that is the characteristic of the mode of ignorance and to uh, so put it another way you can say that some people make things happen they are thoughtful okay we'll do this you do this you do this will they make things happen some people watch things happen they try to do one thing but you know, oh they in rushing out with one thing they make a mess of the second thing third thing fourth thing this went wrong that went wrong that went wrong just watch things happen some people make things happen some people watch things happen and some people wonder what happened <laughs> <laughs> so they just so lost in their own world <laughs> this is not even aware so this is broadly goodness passion and ignorance so those who make things happen goodness those who watch things happen their passion they try to do things but just too many things go off unwanted and those who just uh, watch what's happening that's that's in the mode of they just they just don't even understand what is happening at all just lost so now these three modes they shape not just our perception they shape our whole interaction with the world now in our interaction with the world Uh, we broadly interact in two ways that we take in knowledge from the outer world and that is the done through the gyan indriyas the eyes the ears the nose the tongue the skin krishna says in 15.8 that all of them present the input to the mind shrotram chakshu sparshanam cha rasanam ghranam eva cha adishthaya manashayam vishayan upasevate so we take in knowledge from the outer world and then we act on the outer world through the working senses through the hands the legs to the power of speech <clears throat> now when we are doing this interacting to the world in these two modes we take in information we execute action and so we could say if you want to do some alliterative terminology we perceive the world we process what we are perceived perceived and then we pursue we do course of action so p e r c e i v and p u r s u e perceive 
process pursue these three are brought we what we do when we are interacting with the world now the modes can affect all these three the modes can shape how we perceive things itself a person uh, two people may come to the same room a person in the mode of goodness will look okay oh there's such a big library over here i can read so many books a person in the mode of goodness hey there's a nice couch i can go and sleep over there <laughs> so in the same room they come but the direction of their vision will be different that's what we perceive varies depending on the mode we are in similarly how we process different people based on the mode they will process differently and then pursue what we will we do so when we talk about resolution it is largely in terms of the action that we do in the outer world so krishna in the 18th chapter of the bhagavad gita talks about the three modes of material nature and there he talks about first knowledge in the three modes then he talks about work in the three modes and then he talks about determination in the three modes also so knowledge we could say broadly means how we perceive the world how we take things in from the world and then uh, process is what we do internally and pursue means how we act in the world so with respect to that it is determination so i don't want to make this class very analytical but just i'll talk about primarily the aspect of pursue and now how we look at the world because ultimately our actions are shaped by our perceptions if i am going through a desert and if i see a mirage i will chase after it because i think it is water so if i want to change my actions if somebody is terribly thirsty and catches like don't go over there why i am thirsty there is water over there no there is no water over there unless we change the perception of that person the action will not change our action is a result of our hari krishna our action is a result of our perception the way we perceive things determines what we will pursue so let's look at what krishna says about the three modes how it affects the knowledge that we acquire let's start from bottom up 18.20 21 and 22 in the gita talk about knowledge in the three modes so 18.22 is knowledge in ignorance now it's a paradoxical statement what do you mean knowledge and ignorance are two opposite things so how can we have knowledge in ignorance knowledge in ignorance means that there is knowledge but that knowledge does not promote understanding that knowledge actually deepens ignorance let's see how that happens so he says in 18.22 yattu krutsnavade kasmin karye saktamah etukam atattvartava dalpam cha tattamasam udahartam is this clear behind or is the voice going up and down you are clear so he says yattu krutsnavad ekasmin when one looks at one thing and makes that into everything when one looks at one feature of reality and makes that into everything that is perception or knowledge in the mode of ignorance so in term in practical terms say we could say uh, in america there was racism in india there was casteism what is happening in these cases we look at only one thing about a person oh we look at the color of their skin and we assume this person must be like this or we look at the family of birth of a particular person and this person like this so that that person is a multifaceted human being but we reduce them to one aspect of their being so the mode of ignorance is very conducive to prejudice because how do how do we get prejudiced prejudice basically means that from a small experience we make a huge extrapolation we have a little experience oh this person was like this therefore people from this region are like this this person is like this therefore people of this country are like this or people of this caste are like this people of this race are like this so when we take one feature and make it into everything yattu kutsnavan ekasmin that is knowledge in the mode of ignorance so last year when i had come to america and uh, i was in a college program and after that i was talking with one of the students and then he told me that he he grew up in a foster home so then as we became a little closer we were talking many things i asked him what happened did your parents die in an accident he said no both my parents are alive 
I said, what? If both your parents are alive, then why are you in a foster home? He said, when I was five, my parents divorced. It was a very bitter divorce. And both of them, they told me that this marriage was the biggest mistake of my life. And you remind me of that mistake. So both the parents said, we don't want anything to do with you. And despite having parents, the boy had to go to, to the children's care department and he was put in the foster home. Now it's so tragic. Yes, people can have differences. They may not be able to live together. But to reduce another human being to just one feature, you, know, you are the product of that mistake. The child is a person on his own. So this may appear very drastic. Uh, it may appear very, how can anyone do like that? But you know, when the mind becomes biased in a particular way, it's, it happens. In the fourth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a story of uh, Sati, of Daksha's daughter, Dakshayani and Daksha. Now Daksha felt that Shiva had offended him. And Shiva was married to Sati, or Daksha, Dakshayani, he was his daughter. So then when there was, a, there was a celebration at his house, he did not invite his daughter and her son-in-law. Son but she thought, this is just my home, I'll go there. And she came there, but he completely neglected her. Now why did he neglect her? She thought, this is my father, this is the home where I lived and grew up. But she did not see her as his daughter. He saw her only as the wife of the man who disrespected me. And therefore, by neglecting her, I am getting back at that man who disrespected me. And then eventually, things went so bad that Sati felt so devastated that she was ready to immolate herself. And even then, Daksha did not do anything. So what happens? We take one feature of a person and make that into everything. So when that happens, that we and then why is it called knowledge? Because we have some knowledge. And then what we will do is also, if I have a bias against a particular person, if I think, okay, people of this caste are like this, this race are like this, then I will get, selectively get whatever information will reinforce my idea. This is called cherry picking information. So if I think this person is a very domineering person, then no, I will remember all the incidents when this person tried to dominate me. <laughs> there might be other incidents that the person is nice, kind, respectful, but it's we we'll just forget that. So no, there is knowledge, but the knowledge is very selective, selective to the point of being deceptive. So that is knowledge in the mode of ignorance. How all this is related to the resolutions, I'll come to it a, it a little later. But let's look at knowledge in the mode of passion. So Krishna says, this is 18.21 Prutaktvena tu yajjnanam nana bhava prutakvidhan vitti sarveshu bhuteshu tadjnanam vidhirajasam So he says that when we see different bodies and we see this means different natures basically we equal pe people, we equate people with their material bodies that is knowledge in the mode of passion so that means that in the mode of ignorance also we will be looking at a person but we don't even look at the full person, we just look at their complexion or their birth. So in, in mode of ignorance we see even material reality fragmentally. In the mode of passion we see only material reality. In the mode of goodness Krishna says we see the material and the spiritual. I will come to that in a few minutes. But when we see only the material uh, reality then our perceptions are based, our actions are based very much on externals. So, say a young boy and a young girl, they get attracted to each other. A boy looks at the girl's looks, the girl looks also at the boy, boy's looks, or the girl looks at the boy's bank balance. And then, you know, <laughs> and then they get attracted to each other. And they form a relationship. And when they form a relationship, they say, they fight against the whole world. They say, I can't live without this person. I can't live without you. And then as they come to closer to each other, they get to know each other. 
maybe they get married also they stay for some time and then in the externals are not the whole person they start getting to know the other side of the person and then the same two people i can't live without this person now they say i can't live with this person <laughs> <laughs> so it just oscillation from one extreme to the other extreme so in the mode of passion we focus only on the externals external means the material body and we judge people based on their externals in the mode of goodness we see both the material and the spiritual sarvabhuteshu enaikam bhavam avyayam ikshate avibhaktam vibhakteshu tajjnanam vidhisatvikam he says we see that in all living beings there is the imperishable spirit that animates them all and that spirit is the same so this means that in the mode of goodness we see that there is diversity all of us are materially different but spiritually we are similar we are all souls we are all parts of krishna so we may not at this stage just in the mode of goodness we may not see the soul and the soul's relationship with krishna but all that we see is there is a spiritual commonality among all everyone so to be able to see the material and the spiritual together that is knowledge in the mode of goodness and of course in the more in, in transcendence right we see everyone as a part of krishna sarvabhu <coughs> ट्रांसेंड से so now based on how we perceive things how uh, our actions will follow so if we perceive in the mode of ignorance then say if i make a resolution the impetus for making the resolution is also i just think sometimes nowadays there are a lot of people who are concerned about uh, becoming obese and they want to lose weight and there are many uh, weight loss diets uh, some of some of them are good some of them are quite damaging to the health they just all kinds of crazy things people do to try to lose weight and then they just here one they just you look at one picture this person was like this this person became like this so they are saying they are two separate people also sometimes <laughs> <laughs> they are not the same person they are two separate <laughs> <laughs> photoshop okay <laughs> so sometimes you just look at that now okay some people may just even change like that whether that is that kind of change is sustainable and how healthy it is just look at one aspect and we go for it so if our resolution is based on fragmented material perception then that action will also not be sustainable i'll come to the sustainability action afterwards but i'm just right now talking about uh how our resolution will be say shaped by our perception so if i just see a fragmented aspect of material reality it is so i am going to do so then that sort of knowledge because it is incomplete knowledge it is not sustainable if i look only at the material and not at the spiritual then also i may make some resolutions but then the whole resolution depends solely on my will power because i don't see anything higher beyond myself matter is all that is so at that time we depend entirely on our own will power but when we see matter and spirit together then we understand that the soul is interacting with the body and the soul has some capacity to control things of course in mode of transcend in transcendence we connect with krishna so but broadly speaking our perceptions will shape our actions and unless the knowledge we have acquired is proper the resolution will not be sustainable because it's based on fragmented knowledge sometimes we may say that oh you know i i want to work very hard so i am sleeping 6 hours every day from tomorrow i'll sleep 4 hours 
now i may hear somebody who is sleeping 4 hours and i say i'll sleep 4 hours but that's not healthy that's not sustainable for most people the body is variable and different people need different amounts of time for sleeping you just want to take one idea and does something so then it doesn't work now to take this further let's look at 18.33 and 35 where krishna talks about determination in the three modes hmm? there he talks about first let's look at determination in the mode of ignorance yaya swapnam bhayam shokam vishadam madame vacha na vimunchati durmedha druti sa partha tamasi so druti sa partha tamasi is determination in the mode of ignorance and what happens about this yaya swapnam this people swapna they dreaming here is talking about day dreaming i will do this i will do that i will do that <laughs> is dream no but they don't do anything now once there were three frogs on the sill of a well two frogs decided to jump into the well how many frogs remained all three all three because yeah <laughs> Yeah, all three remained <laughs> because they only decided. No, the the two frogs decided to jump into the well. How many remained? All three remained because they only decided. They did not act on it. <laughs> so sometimes our thought just stay in the daydream. I'll do this. I'll do that. I will do that. I'll do that. But it never goes beyond that. There is no systematic plan. There is no action. Just yeah, open up. and conversely there is bhayam fearfulness paranoia this will go wrong that will go wrong that will go wrong now anxiety or fear is just natural and fear is not only natural it is actually essential if i look down from a skyscraper or i peer down i feel some fear and that's good that fear protects me from the danger over there so if a if a child is peering out from a 10 story building and a child feels no fear and the mother will feel great fear <laughs> come back what are you doing isn't it so fear is a natural and essential protector from danger but fear is different from fearfulness when there is a danger the response to it is fear that acts as a caution but when the danger is not there and still the fear remains so i have come back i i look down from that window but now i come back i'm sitting comfortably at my home but still i'm thinking oh i peer down what if i fall down what if i fall down what if i fall down so in the absence of the stimulus when the fear is present that is fearfulness so this also happens in the mode of ignorance that we just get continuously caught in thinking about terrible things now why is this called determination normally we think of determination as something positive i'm determined to do this but determination basically means the capacity to hold on to something even when it is difficult or even when it is painful so the converse of determination is obstinacy somebody is obstinate just keeping on doing it although it's bad for them so this kind of compulsive worrying is actually obstinacy what are we getting by that worrying we getting nothing but still we keep worrying keep worrying now worry is like the interest we pay on loans we haven't yet taken <laughs> it's like the interest we pay on loans we haven't yet taken so it's just the problem is not there but still we are worrying about it so it is actually distressing but still we somehow hold on to it hold on to it hold on to it so it's called determination but it's perverse determination it's obstinacy ya swapnam bhayam shokam shoka is lamentation vishadam is moroseness madame vacha and when none of, when nothing works oh this is going wrong that is going wrong that is going wrong then madam just forget everything the solution to every problem lies at the bottom of a bottle of alcohol drink and forget now we munchati durmedha one who doesn't give up this kind of behavior despite it the behavior causing trouble that is dutti sa partha tamasi dutti that is determination of ignorance so now vishada and mother oh that went wrong that went wrong that went wrong mother nothing is going to work right 
so sometimes the people just uh, some people find solutions to every problem and some people find problems with every solution <laughs> <laughs> so that's how some people think so what happens in the mode of ignorance is that we make some resolution and somehow we are not able to keep it and then we are not able to keep it then just that oh you know i failed i failed i failed only that oh i could not keep i could not do it i could not do it i could not do it that keeps going on a perpetual replay inside us and we feel completely disempowered completely hopeless completely helpless i couldn't do it i'm good for nothing i'll never be able to do it i am useless in terms of analysis of capacity to control in our life there are some things which are in our control and some things which are not in our control so but again the perception is done wrongly based on the modes so in the mode of ignorance we underestimate our capacity to control we think nothing is in my control some people say destiny is rotten you know my destiny is only rotten everything is going to go wrong in my life but this is yes all of us get go through bad phases when many bad things happen to us but that doesn't mean always bad things are going to happen but when we just look at the bad things only in life and think oh you know this happened to me that happened to me that happened to me that happened to me how oh, we say oh so many bad things have happened to me and we start just feeling sorry for ourselves and we go into what can be called as a pity party <laughs> i feel like pity for ourselves so this is more of ignorance we just look at the bad things that have happened and even the bad some our resolutions we couldn't keep and we just feel sorry for ourselves so those in the mode of ignorance they they say that i don't have any determination now whatever i try to do i can't do it sometimes some devotees say they try to wake up in the morning yeah i have no determination i can't wake up in the morning well you have determination how you have determination to keep sleeping in the morning <laughs> <laughs> so nobody can say that i don't have determination <laughs> actually if somebody says i'm an alcoholic you know there is a, a british player i very played mark twain he said that giving up cigarettes smoking is the easiest thing in the world i have done it over 100 times <laughs> <laughs> so if i gave it up 100 times what happened i gave it up and i took it up again so or uh, it came back to me again and i couldn't resist it so the point is that somebody says i have no determination to give up smoking but that means you have determination to keep smoking and any unwanted behavior that we do it has its consequences You know, if we are too lazy, then our whole schedule gets disrupted. You know, we lose respect for ourselves. Others lose respect for us. We feel miserable. But if we keep doing it, still, in spite of all that, that means we have determination. But it is misdirected determination. So nobody can say that I don't have any determination. We all have determination. If it is not determination to do the right thing, it is determination to do the wrong thing. and determination to do the wrong thing we often call as attachment when i am attached to something attachment when i am attached to something that means that i am holding on to it very firmly so now the for us to keep our resolutions we need to raise our determination from ignorance to passion to transcend to goodness and ultimately to transcendence so everybody has determination it is just a matter of where it is directed so in the mode of ignorance we just uh, try something it doesn't work and then we just lose confidence i can never be able to do it and we just quit but we are not quitting in entirely we are quitting changing ourselves but that means we are persisting and continuing the way we are now what happens in the mode of passion krishna says eya tu dharma ka marthan नृत्याधारे अर्जुन प्रसंग फलाकांक्षी धृति सपर्थराजसी या तो धर्म काम दैट हियर कृष्णा से फॉर काम फॉर फुलफिलिंग वन डिजायर्स और अर्थ फॉर अर्निंग मनी 
for these people trutya dharayate arjuna one works with great determination prasangena phala kaangshi prasangena one is very attached phala akaangshi with the craving for the fruit that is determination in the mode of passion now many materialistic people especially those materialistic people who have achieved something in their lives they have determination like this oh even to to do anything in this world requires determination if somebody is a sports player they want to become a world champion athlete and they regulate their diet they exercise they do workouts they work extremely hard in the world even if we are destined to achieve something the destiny also doesn't fall into our lap whatever we are destined to get also we have to work to get it so people who become successful at the material level they work very hard but their motivation is what artha kama that they want wealth and they want sensual enjoyment and for that purpose they are ready to work extremely hard so bhakti vinod thakur in one of his books says that you know i feel inspired on seeing the materialists that just as they work for, so hard for their material profit let me similarly hard for krishna so now how is it that the person in the mode of passion has determination sometimes we say if, if our senses are uncontrolled if our mind is uncontrolled then we will not be able to do anything but we see many materialistic people they work extremely hard and they achieve a lot of things in their life so so is it that they have controlled their mind they control their senses not exactly it is rather than saying that they have controlled their mind and senses it is that their mind and senses have controlled them completely so in some cases for us we are when the mind and senses control us they pull us in many directions come on eat this watch this touch this when they pull us in different directions aneka chitta vibhranta mohajal samavrita i want to do this i want to do that i want to do that so then we can't do much at that time we just pulled in too many directions but sometimes the mind and senses work in such a way that one desire captivates them and when that desire comes captivates the mind and senses then our full determination gets directed to that desire so if somebody just becomes convinced you know, i want to become the world's number one tennis player then that becomes that driving dream now it's not that their mind and senses are under control it is they have a particular desire what do you mean by saying mind and senses are under control or not in control actually we have to see who is controlling the mind and senses is it the soul who is controlling the mind and senses or is it some material desire that is controlling the mind and senses so in some cases the material is uh, normally we have many material desires but if one material desire becomes very strong and that acquires control over the person then it may appear as if that person has tremendous will power and the person is working extremely hard and of course they are working hard and for the determination that they have for the sacrifices that they do credit can be given but the point is that it's not that they have controlled mind and senses rather one among the many desires in their mind one has somehow captivated them and now they are fully or largely controlled by that that desire so in the mode of passion we can work very hard but usually what happens in the mode of passion is we get obsessed with something which is material and temporary so we get that fruit but after getting that fruit it is almost always the material goals that we achieve they turn out to be an anti climax just when i think i'm going to be successful, i'm at the top of the world oh, we climb up the mountain we reach the top and we are about to plant our victory flag on the summit and as we plant the victory flag on the summit we find that summit is just a cave it's a valley and you just fall right into the valley <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is that after we achieve something we find it's not really that great i am from india and india is a very you could say education infatuated country <laughs> <laughs> so since my childhood 
my dream yeah, since my childhood my dream was i wanted to be a topper i wanted to be number 1 in my class in my uh, in my school in my college and i was always among the toppers but i was never the topper <laughs> somehow i was second third fourth joint first but i was never the first <laughs> so that was like a big big dissatisfaction and craving within me in my third year in my engineering i applied i appeared for gre now at that time gre was 24 2400 marks 800 marks for maths 800 marks for uh, uh, analytical ability and 800 for language so generally indians don't do so well in language for me since my childhood one of my hobbies was just to pick up a dictionary and memorize words so i loved dictionary i loved english words so that was not a problem so then at that time i worked very hard and i gave my gre exam and i got that time 20 out of 2400 so i was not just first in my class i was first not just in my college i was first in the history of my college so i thought all my dreams have come true now like in sports you say yeah oh i done it <laughs> so i was celebrating like that <laughs> after that i came to my college and then uh, many of my friends and other people they came and congratulated me but somehow it happened that three of my close friends they forgot to congratulate me <laughs> and the first time it happened i said i'm Why is he not congratulating me? Doesn't he know what I've achieved? <laughs> Then second time also the same thing happened. And third time it happened. I was just angry. And then suddenly it is like as if I looked at myself from an out of body perspective, <laughs> and I felt, hey, wait a minute, what is going on? And I thought by achieving this, I'll become happy. But actually, I have ended up. becoming more dependent for my happiness on others earlier i could just interact with people normally but now i am interacting i am so needy now why are you not congratulating me so i said hey, where is the happiness here actually the happiness just looking at the mark sheet the mark sheet is not like a beautiful dt of krishna that you can keep looking at <laughs> looking at the mark sheet is much better so okay i realize that so i realize that there has to be that okay i can give another exam i can again crack that exam but what is the again i'll be dependent on externals there must be something which gives higher happiness what is that and that's how i started exploring uh, somehow by krishna's arrangement that time i got a bhagavad gita and then i started reading it and krishna said in the bhagavad gita in the 6th chapter that when we attain samadhi at that time that is a achievement having achieved which will feel there nothing more to achieve yam labdha cha param labam manyate nadikam tatah that having achieved this there's nothing more to achieve 6.22 in the gita i felt this is what is really an achievement worth seeking in one's life no matter what else what else i achieve always i'll be dependent on others externals for validation for congrats for felicitation so in the mode of passion we may work very hard to achieve some but what we seek to achieve doesn't turn out to be what it promised to be it lets us down that's why determination in the mode of passion often doesn't lead to satisfaction either we are not able to achieve it or even if we achieve it it turns out to be anti climax then the mode of goodness krishna says drutyaya dharayate mana pranendriya kriya yogena vivicharinya druti sapartha satviki krishna says we control our mind and senses <coughs> mana prana indriya kriya and how do we control it yogena by the study practice of yoga and by this when we act with determination that is determination in the mode of goodness so in the mode of passion we are actually very determinedly following the mind senses to whatever desire they want us to fulfill whereas in the mode of goodness we control the mind and senses and pursue a goal that is truly worthwhile and we pers- how do we sustain the determination yogena by the practice of yoga it's interesting that since the 1920s scientists scientists have been trying to 
look at the effect of religion on people's behavior Sigmund Freud and others they had the idea that religion is like a narcosis now religion faith in God is a delusion that's what some people say so they so researchers are trying to look at what happens they compare the psychological the mental states mental health of religious people and non-religious people and they found that consistently religious people they have better physical health they have better mental health and there's a the Cambridge University published a handbook of religion and health where they compiled 2000 published studies all over the world about the relationship between religion and physical health, religious factors and uh, physical health parameters as a physical such as stroke heart attack and other things as well as mental health parameters as stress anxiety and other things and they found consistently a positive correlation that religious people had better physical health better mental health in fact they also said that just people live longer than their non-religious peers but more significant for us they found that if a religious person and a non-religious person they make a resolution to do something in general exceptions will always be there but overall the religious people the percentage that they keep their resolution is much more than the non-religious people in fact there's a in 2007 there's an article on this in new york times i at that time I had written a book on recession the recession was going on globally so i quoted that article so there's the new york times said that the article's theme was that if you want to keep your new year resolutions add one more resolution and that resolution is to stick to your religious commitment so if you stick to your religious commitment somehow they said that will give you the willpower to stick to your other commitments so i'll conclude with two points and then you can have question answers so now religious commitment can mean many different things to different people for us yoga is bhakti yoga and bhakti yoga i'll say for us the primary activity is chanting Hare Krishna. so recently a devotee was asking me a question we say initially that you chant Hare Krishna, you will control your mind will be controlled. You will be able to control your mind. But then after I start chanting Hare Krishna, now devotees tell me to, to chant Hare Krishna, you have to control your mind. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the reality? <laughs> Does chanting help us to control the mind or do we have to control the mind to chant? So <laughs> I told him that actually for doing anything in life we have to have some level of control of the mind even if you want to enjoy watching a movie you have to control the mind and focus on the movie you know, if in the movie some action scene is coming start looking somewhere else you'll miss the action you're not in the movie so some amount of focus which means control of the mind is required for doing anything in life and similarly for chanting also some amount of control of the mind is required however the difference between other activities and chanting if everywhere control of mind is required what is the difference the difference is chanting purifies our mind and by that purification the forces that cause the mind to go out of control they decrease in their power and that's how chanting promotes the control of the mind in a much more effective way so i may be attentive and read a book for one hour and i may feel peaceful by that i may be attentive and watch a movie for one hour or i may be attentive and chant Hare krishna for one hour in all of these at being at being attentive is a prerequisite but the effect okay after watching a movie how long am i going to feel peaceful after the thoughts of the movie go out of my mind then all the problems of the world will come back to me I read a book it's a nice but after that it depends on what I am reading also it will not last long but if I chant attentively the result will last much longer so it's like uh, weight lifting if I have to lift a 20 kg weight it's going to require an effort but if I have a lever a system of a lever by which you know I can press over here and the weight gets lifted over there so then I may have to apply only that much force which is equivalent to lifting a 2 kg weight by that 20 kg weight get lifted so chanting will also require application 
chanting also requires determination but if we can resolve to connect with krishna through our chanting that will calm our mind and by calm the calmer mind everything else that we have to do will be able to do it more effectively so that's why if uh, we want to sustain our resolutions the strongest the, the first resolution that we need to sustain is the resolution to solidify our religious commitment it may be holy names it may be studying scriptures it may be worshiping the deities whatever it is if we do that that will help us in everything else because that will help us to not just control the mind but to purify the mind what is the difference between controlling the mind and purifying the mind controlling the mind means opposing force is there but i am restricting it purifying the mind means the opposing force itself goes away just like say many of us may have been eating meat before uh, but now you say if i traveling on a plane and see somebody else eating meat uh, how much do we feel irresistibly attracted to eating that meat uh, well not so much really. most of us we don't even notice it so what has happened here the we have become purified that means the desire itself has gone away this also happens by the process of bhakti so by contact with the all pure krishna to to contact all pure krishna also we need some will power we need some resolution we need some determination but that determination will have a spiraling effect it will it will go over and make us better in control of the rest of our lives and then how can we get this determination to stick to our resolutions in bhakti hmm? so <clears throat> i'll talk about three things over here that's the last conviction association and process uh, rupa jiva goswami in the shat sandarbha says that for the pure devotees they stay in krishna consciousness in bhakti because of preeti because of their attraction towards krishna but sadhak they will stay in krishna consciousness by their buddhi by their intelligence we don't have spontaneous attraction to krishna so we need intelligence so that's why if we see if we want to if we hear a very good class on the importance of the holy name and next day when we chant feel inspired to chant what happens uh, our intelligence needs to be convinced so conviction so regular study of scripture hearing of scripture that gives us the impetus to push on even when our mind starts saying no enough i don't want to do this conviction so we regularly nourish ourselves intellectually why do i want to do this then i write it down and read it. keep the intellectual well, intelligence well nourished the second is association association means that actually our desires are not just linear they are triangular what do i mean by this linear means say i see a particular item and i want to eat it so if i see a gulab jamun hey delicious i want to eat it that's linear desire the first time when i started traveling abroad i had gone to australia and there one devotee offered me a baklava i didn't know till that time what is a baklava he says would you like to have baklava maybe later and then there's a devotee with me we both were waiting for prasadam he got the baklava and he ate it delicious i look at him give me also one <laughs> <laughs> so so seeing the baklava did seeing the object did not create the desire but seeing somebody else enjoying that object created the desire <laughs> so that is our desires are not just linear they are triangular Hmm? so this triangularity of desires is what advertisers use when they have celebrities endorse their products you know there are so many new cell phones that come up but say a hollywood star or a sports star say this is the cell phone i use oh really use that i want to use it also so triangularity of desires and this triangularity is especially important in spiritual life because the object to which we want to be attracted that may not seem so attractive to our senses the chanting of the holy name is okay that's nice but the holy name is just one mantra and what is so attractive about it if we see somebody chanting attentively then what is this person getting in this chanting we come into the temple look at the deities 
they look very attractive but nice somebody may say nice decorated dolls there but if we meet a devotee who has been worshiping the worshiping the deities for years and years day after day month after month year after year can we talk with them what is this devotee getting in this it must be something special over here so for us that if we want to be sustain sustain our spiritual life uh, sustain our spiritual determination <laughs> tapping the triangularity of our desires is very important that means if i want to do something i need to have someone else who will inspire me to do it so if i want to memorize verses i said i want to memorize one verse every day i start with one verse today and the next verse i remember after one week <laughs> the next after one month and then after one year i want to memorize the verse every day now again okay, start off but if i start with some other devotee and then we decide okay every day every, every week we will memorize one verse every day is too much it's not possible every week we will memorize and then every week when we meet in the temple i will ask you which verse you have memorized you ask me which verse i have memorized and then what will happen i think when i go to the temple he will ask me she will ask me then that will inspire us to memorize so basically association is extremely important resolutions that are done alone they are almost very almost impossible to sustain the mind gets us alone and then gets us <laughs> it gets us alone disconnected from everyone oh, i alone i'm going to do this you know i will stand top above all other devotees nobody else can do it i alone can do it and then it gets us alone and then gets us and we do we can't do it we can't sustain it so association and last thing is process c i see c a p as a cap <laughs> acronym you could say p p means process means it is we are finite and fallible human beings so the process of growing towards a resolution or sticking to a resolution is going to come with slips and falls it is the it is the mode of passion which makes us think that you know if you are going to do this better do it perfectly otherwise don't do it only but how many of us can in the rest of our life where all do we do things perfectly and if we cook food for the first time if i decide if i cook food i'll cook perfectly otherwise i'll not cook only i'll be star over is it said if i if i do i've got to if i'm going to ride a cycle i'm going to ride a cycle perfectly and you'll never ride a cycle we fall down we learn so that's how it is in spiritual life also so what happens we think that if i make a resolution i must stick to it only if i stick to it i am successful if i if i can't stick to it better not make it only but it's not like that you say if i decide to make a resolution every day i am going to read bhagavatam for half an hour every day now even if i can't st- if i stick to it for one month then on the 31st day 32nd day i can't do it you know oh, i failed in my resolution but what happens in the in transcendence we don't just look at the resolution we look at the purpose of the resolution the purpose of the resolution is not just to stick to the resolution the purpose of the resolution is to establish a connection with krishna isn't it why, why do you want to read books for why do you want to chant the holy names for it is to connect with krishna and for the 30 days that i read daily i had a connection with krishna in that sense i was successful so if we fixate too much on the fact that i am going to make this resolution i will keep it lifelong then one day we are not able to keep up keep it up, all our determination will go away you are good for nothing but rather thinking like that the resolution is important but the purpose is more important if i connect with krishna i am getting purified i am getting spiritual advance so even if i can't stick to the resolution in the future let me make a finite time bound resolution stick to it and as long as i stick to it i am moving forwards bhakti is actually very subtle at sometimes i may make a resolution and i succeed in it but i i may fail in my bhakti on the other hand i make a resolution i may fail in the resolution but i may succeed in my bhakti how is that say it's ekadashi and i decide i am going to fast without water i'm determined to fast without water but while fasting without water i go to the kitchen and look at who all who all are eating what <laughs> this person so attached this person sense gratifier this person hopeless so what is happening 
my body is fasting but my ego is feasting <laughs> and even if i succeed in the resolution i succeed in the resolution but i fail in my bhakti because how much am i remembering krishna i want to thinking i am better better than others i become superior on the other hand sometimes i may make a resolution i may fail in the resolution but if that makes me humble that makes me feel the need for krishna krishna i am so conditioned i am so fallen i need you please help me and that makes me more dependent on krishna call out to krishna more intensely then by that calling out to krishna actually i may make more advancement then by being successful in keeping the resolution but becoming proud by that so that's why we even while making a resolution we don't see the resolution separate from the purpose of the resolution the purpose of the resolution is to connect with krishna and as long as we stick to the resolution we are connecting and that is a success in that sense so we need to says, be detached from the fruits of your work so we we make a resolution so that we can connect with krishna but sometimes we may not be able to stick to the resolution so no need to get too worried about that okay i stuck to the resolution for this much time now situation has changed in my life i can't stick to it now okay let me do whatever is required in the situation and then in future when my situation becomes better i'll have this experience also and i can i can make a resolution so rather than making a lifelong resolution better make a time bound resolution stick to it learn from the experience and then we can either renew the same resolution or we can make some other resolution based on what we find is beneficial for us so this way if we see the resolution resolution in transcendence means what we see the connection with krishna and we focus not on the resolution but on the connection with krishna by that we will all move forward steadily and irrespective of whether we stick to the specific resolutions or not whether we succeed in specific resolutions or not we will succeed in moving towards krishna and that is this ultimate success that is the ultimate purpose of all resolutions so i'll summarize i spoke today about resolution in the three modes i started by talking about how most new resolutions are not new because something sabotages our resolutions to understand what sabotage is it i discuss about the three modes more the subtle forces that shape the interaction between matter and consciousness and <coughs> they they shape how we perceive things how we process them and how what we pursue so i talked about the theater some people run away some people just get pet petrified some people go for fire extinguisher so in goodness first contemplation then action in passion first action then contemplation in passion so in ignorance neither contemplation nor action only delusion mm. then in uh, acknowledge or perception in the mode of ignorance means we look at fragmented material reality label people based on their race or their caste or one particular behavioral pattern or we label ourselves also based on one failure we think i am a failure and i am good for nothing in mode of passion we look only at externals at the material and we think that is the essential person and that's why uh, we oscillate i can't live without this person i can't live with this person so we oscillate in extremes and in mode of goodness we see the complete picture we see the matter and the spirit and in this holistic picture then we act so in transcendence we see the spirit as a part of krishna and krishna and talk about determination in three modes that determination in the mode of ignorance means we hold on to things even when those things hurt us so like daydreaming worrying being pessimistic being morose But these are this, this, nobody can say i don't have determination because we have the determination to hold on to the unwanted behavioral pattern so we just need to redirect that determination in the mode of passion it is uh, we can work very hard we seem to have a lot of determination but it is not that we have controlled the mind and senses for our purpose rather a particular desire produced by the mind and senses has become our purpose and that controls us and drives us the the problem with determination in the mode of passion is that what we achieve turns out to be an anti climax even if we achieve it in in goodness we focus on yoga in our vicharanya we try to control our mind and senses for a higher purpose and we get the determination to control that uh, to buy the by process of yoga means connection with krishna so chanting also requires control of the mind as any other activity would require but chanting purifies the mind so that that mind control will percolate in all aspects of our life 
it's like i have to exercise exercise exert energy to lift a weight but chanting is like i lift a 2 kg worth of i exert 2 kg worth of energy on a lever and a 20 kg weight gets lifted up how do we get the determination to chant or to practice bhakti determinedly first is conviction we have to regularly nourish our intelligence by hearing a scripture especially appropriate aspects of scripture that sustain the particular resolution a is association our desires are not just linear but triangular so if we have somebody else who inspires us to do the same thing then we can sustain and last is process process means it's not that once i have done it i should be able to do it always the process is we connect with krishna for as long as we can and that connection will purify us the very process of functioning for us finite fallible human beings is that we will may take a few steps we will fall again we get up we fall so rather than expecting perfection we just work with whatever we have and by that connection we will become purified so we redefine success not just as sticking to the resolution for all the time but rather connecting with krishna as as long as we can in whatever way we can with this redefined success we can always stay connected with krishna and grow in our bhakti thank you very much hare krishna hare Are there any questions or comments? Yes. Somebody has not asked till now. If somebody else, somebody else has asked questions, we'll come. We'll come. Yes. I I had this well sort of this thought, this question. Um, I I kind of think like, well, why why make a resolution? You know, you got to do something. Just just do it. I mean. I, I don't see like why I, I have to say, all right, I'm going to do this now. No, just go do it. And that's success. Okay. So why do we need to do resolutions? Why can't we just do the right thing? Yes, we all have different kinds and different uh, ways in which our inner world works. So some of us, we may just be able to spontaneously, I'm going to do this and just do it. It works. Some people. They are more action oriented. Just okay, start it off, do it. But some people need to process things in the inner world. I'm going to do it. So we have to see what works best with our particular mind, what we have. So if some of us we just do it, we get a taste of success by doing it and feel like doing it, and we keep doing it. That's fine. Some people have to process things in their head and then do it. So the nature of the mind and the senses are such that. no one formula works at the material level for everyone the shoe that fits one leg bites another leg so for some people it will just start it and move with it for some people they start it and they just stop so why am i doing this they have to think about it they have to commit to it so depending on our particular uh, way our particular mind works sooner or later we have to get out of our head and do things no doubt about it but for some of us to sustain that we being in our head and having the impetus in our head helps so we have to see what works but ultimately yes we have to do it it's only by doing it we will get the experience we will get the taste and then we will be able to sustain it thank you let's go so the chanting in three modes of material nature sometimes the modes are very heavy uh, you know mm-hmm. the guys ंग that we cannot fight for very long against our body the body has its needs and if i sleep late and then i have to wake up early and as i am feeling sleepy it is not going to work the krishna has given us the body we have a responsibility to serve krishna but we also have a responsibility to provide the body its needs 
Krishna says, Krishna is talking about yogis who have gone to the jungle in the sixth chapter. Chuchaudeshya Patishtapya Siramasana Matmana. Those who have gone out to the jungle and they are doing meditation. And for them, Krishna is saying, Natya Ashnatas to Yoga Osti Na Chai Kanta Ashnata Na Chati Sopna Shilas Se Jagrata Na Iva Chajuna. Krishna says, if you eat too much or eat too little, if you sleep too much or sleep too little, you cannot be a yogi. So I want to speak of people like us who are in this world. So, first point is that we have to make sure that we provide the body what it needs. Now, if the body needs a particular quantity of sleep, once in a while, uh, having less sleep and then waking up, fine. But we can't expect the body to do it on a daily basis. So, first is that we need to plan our life in such a way that we are not chanting while half asleep. We may think, oh, so much willpower, I'll wake up in the morning, I'll chant. But actually, chanting in the morning is important, but chanting attentively is equally, if not more important. You know, if, say, if, say now we all, we may work in different time zones. So, if you have an important Skype meeting with somebody in India, here morning 4 o'clock, you have to wake up. Now, if it's an important meeting, you will make sure that you sleep by 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, so that you are not just awake at 4 o'clock, but awake and alert at 4 o'clock. So if it's an important meeting, we rearrange our life in such a way that we are fresh for that meeting. Chanting is the time when we are meeting Krishna. So it's not just we have to wake up early, we have to make sure that we are adequately rested. That's the first point. We have to plan our life in such a way that we get adequate rest and then we chant. Then after that, what happens with respect to chanting is, that for the mind, it's like one devotee was recently asking me, why does my why does my mind matter so much when I chant? I told him, because you are not chanting. What do you mean? I said the tongue is chanting, the mind is wandering, and you are thinking what to do among the two. <laughs> <laughs> and most of the time, the mantra doesn't seem very interesting. The movie that is going on in the mind seems much more interesting. <laughs> so we go off with the mind. And especially in the mind, in the morning, see, externally, the mode of goodness and the mode of ignorance are very similar. In both, in, there is a, in passion, there is activity. In goodness, there is contemplation. That means there is not much activity. There is thoughtfulness. In ignorance, there is not contemplation. There is delusion. But again, there is no activity. So what happens? Actually, chanting is best done when you are in contemplative mood, in the goodness. But externally, goodness and ignorance are similar. So instead of in goodness, we soon slide into ignorance. And then we can't chant very well. So sometimes if you are feeling very sleepy, then just standing up or walking or splashing some water on the face. Basically, sometimes we have to get out of the head in the body. In chanting, say it's like, um, in chanting we want to be aware of spiritual reality. That is the holy name, which is spiritual sound vibration. But for the mind to rise to the spiritual level is quite difficult. So better that we at least, so if this is a physical reality, this is the mental this is a spiritual reality. So when we are chanting, sometimes the mind just goes off into the mental level. If you are not even physically aware what I am doing. Sometimes we chant the whole round, the beats go round and they say, hey really, did I chant a round? I don't even notice. <laughs> so what has happened? We are not available, aware of spiritual reality. We are not remembering Krishna. We are not even aware of physical reality. We are not even counting the beats properly. So what is happening? Just the mind has gone off somewhere. So, ideally, it's good if we rise to spiritual reality by being attentive, by being contemplative. If we are in the mode of goodness, transcendence is very close. But if we cannot be in the mode of goodness, then at least come to physical reality. Come to physical reality means that maybe stand up and walk. Now, we cannot be completely wandering all over if you are walking. Because <laughs> at least where am I walking, I have to see. And that's why even when you go for a walk, it is good not to go for a long walk with a lot of scenery. <laughs> because I start looking here, looking there, looking there. If it's the same place, I have to turn around after a few minutes. Then what happens? I have to keep an eye. So I come back to the physical world once again. I come back to the physical world. Chanting. So basically, uh, if we are in passion to come to goodness, we have to get out of the world and get inside, get into the head. Hmm? So if you are running around doing things, okay, sit down and hear. Sit down and do something contemplative. That takes us to 
passion to goodness but when ignorance is troubling us we have to come from ignorance to passion then from passion we can come to goodness so for to come from ignorance to passion means from the mental level where the mind is in delusion at least become aware of physical reality and start walking that creates some momentum some energy in the body look where you are walking and then try to focus on the at least the sound vibration of the holy name so if my ignorance is there it's very difficult to come to goodness leave alone transcendence so at least we come to passion now walking itself is not in passion but by passion i am simply connoting some physical activity awareness of physical reality so if we are very sleepy and somehow we have had adequate rest but still we are feeling sleepy then it's better to walk for some time get some muscles moving get some blood flowing in the body that will create some energy and then from passion we can move towards goodness thereafter okay thank you hare krishna do any of them yeah mata ji yeah hare krishna i have two questions for you first one is uh, does the place of pre- residence really matters in krishna consciousness like a lot of people uh, live in holy homes and are uh, close by temple so mm. okay place? does the place of residence matter in krishna consciousness <coughs> it is ultimately a matter of consciousness so even if somebody is living far away from a temple or from a holy place if one can be conscious of krishna that is what is important however for most of us our consciousness is usually very caught at the physical level we are affected by physical things quite a bit so if physically we are close to a spiritual place then the possibility of spiritualization of our consciousness is more let's look at it from the other way that say somebody is a alcoholic and they want to give up alcohol and their house happens to be next to a bar <laughs> now no matter how much determination they have now we all may have strong determination but we all have our weak moments and in that weak moment you may slip out of the house go into the bar and drink so for us many times to to make a significant change in our life change of externals is almost always necessary change of externals if for alcoholic they cannot stay next to a bar and give up alcohol the change of external necessary now while change of external is almost always necessary change of externals is almost never sufficient if i'm changing only the externals i just go and stay far away from a bar but then the desire will come in me and then i'll drive all the distance and come to the bar <laughs> so we also have to work on changing the internals so uh, it is that if externally also the spiritual stimuli are easily available to us in the physical environment that we are in then it is more conducive for our spiritual consciousness so that's why it's uh, if we are staying in a dham that is good if we are staying in a near a temple that is good at the same time Uh, we cannot just focus on one thing you know for our bhakti there are many parameters over there like some devotees i know in some city the, the the temple is right close to is right in the heart of the city very expensive area and then to get a house over there they have to take a big loan and they take the loan they are staying next to the house but now to pay the mortgage for the loan they have to take two jobs <laughs> and the temple is next to them but they don't get time to go to the temple and then they just oh i want a house to have a house close to the temple i want a house close to but what is the use if you can't go to the temple so similarly if our place of working is so far away from the temple that we have to work over there and traveling takes one hour two hours we are next to the temple but we hardly ever get to go to the temple so staying close to the temple is one important factor but that is not the sole factor for deciding we have to look at our overall situation and then see what is the best for my practice of similarly staying in the holy dham that is good however the dhams today are places of devotion and they are also places of deviation because there are so many people with so many different ideas and if you don't have the right association then we can just get caught and deluded over there so if we go to a dham it's generally to just to go to retreat to a dham for a few days that is very good we are going to stay in a dham then it is important that we have a well defined service if you don't have a well defined service you say oh i will just chant 64 rounds every day i'll do this i'll do that 
In a few days we will do it and the mind will say what next? And then if we don't have that spiritual taste, then what next will be? There are many people who will be there who will be ready to gossip. You know, this person did like this, you know, this happened like this, this happened like that. See, we will have spare time soon and during our spare time, our mind works over time. <laughs> so, we need to holistically see what is the best for our bhakti. So, geographical proximity to a temple or a dham is very good. But we have to see the balance of other factors in our life and arrive at a balanced decision. Okay? Thank you. Uh, these days, uh, thank you for your uh, How to help a non-Krishna conscious person to overcome depression? Actually, non-Krishna conscious is a better th word than non-devotee. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good word. <laughs> no, it's a good word. Non, uh, okay. Uh, <coughs> and it's definitely better than a karmi. <laughs> it's such a judgmental word. So, okay. So, how do we help others who may not be practicing bhakti right now if they are having depression? <laughs> Basically, if we consider that the physical reality is out. The mind is in here, the soul is here. Okay. So, uh, we don't respond to the physical reality, we respond to the mental representation of the physical reality. So, ideally speaking, our mind should be looking at what is out there. Say, I am looking at you, you are looking at me. So, the physical scene should be replicated on the inner screen. Inner screen is the mind. I am the inner seer. But, the screen is meant to act like a window which shows us what is outside. But sometimes this inner screen starts acting like a TV and just takes me into the past, takes me into the future, takes me all over the world. So then that's when we get absent minded. So I am physically somewhere but my mind is elsewhere. So when this inner screen starts show, going to the past and showing me all the bad things that have happened to me in the past, that is when we get depression. Basically, there are two men major mental health disorders that people have. One is depression, the other is anxiety. So, in depression, the mind goes off to the past and says, this went wrong, that went wrong, that went wrong, that went wrong. Therefore, in future also everything is going to go wrong. So, we get depressed. In anxiety, the mind, the inner screen goes into the future. What if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? And then we get, get fearful, worried, we get a panic attack. So, basically, we need to, uh, bad things have happened to every one of us. For some of us, more bad things may have happened at a particular time than at other times. But the point is that it's happened to everyone. And if we are honest, good things have also happened to us. Otherwise, we would not be where we are right now. So the very fact that we are living among, say, all of us are 25, 30, 40, some of us are, of course, kids. But still, just if we consider how many people have died before the age of 20, 25, 30. In the fact we are living, that means at least some good things have happened in our life. Otherwise, we would, not even, we would not even be alive. So, but somehow, our mind just looks at all the bad things that have happened. So, the key thing is that when the mind is become like a mirror, like, like a TV screen which is replaying the past bad things, to get it back to the present. Get it back to the present. Okay, that's in the past, that's history. Don't think about it so much. Now, it's not possible to not think about something. What we have to do is have something purposeful to think of. Have something tangible to do. That's why people who are depressed, if they have something which they like to do, not just something which is casual entertainment, but something which is valuable for them, something which they consider important. So often depression is caused not so much because so many bad things have happened in our life and we are remembering them, but because we feel we don't have a worthwhile purpose in our life. Uh, see, the material vision of life is we define our success based on our possession. What did I get? I got this, I got that, I got that, I got that. A simple way to understand the difference between material and spiritual is how do I, if I'm in material consciousness, as soon as I see another person, I think, what can this person do for me? If I'm in spiritual consciousness, I think, what can I do for this person? That is spiritual consciousness. Similarly, in material consciousness, we define our self-worth based on possession. 
I see, I've got this car, I've got this house, I've done this, I have made it, I'm a big person. But in spiritual consciousness, we define our self-worth not by our possession, but by our contribution. What can I contribute? What can I do? Contribution also will give us some reciprocation, we'll learn something, we'll possess something. But our focus is in what I can do. So if uh, if we can help that person find out what is it that they would like to do in their lives. And now I don't feel like doing anything they say. Okay, these bad things that have happened to you, before these things happened, what would have you like to do in your life? Not just in superficial saying, I want to go to Disneyland, I want to go here, I want to go there. But no, at the end of your life, what would you like to be remembered by? What do you want to contribute in your life? Uh, then that will give them something worthwhile to do. So that way, we give, bring them to the present and give them, help them find a purpose for themselves in the present. Sometimes people say live in the present. It's not we can live in the present, but we are not meant to live for the present. Because the, if the present is gloomy, you know, if I have got a terrible painful disease, and you tell me live in the present, I can't live, I've got so much pain. You know, we live for something bigger than the present. Uh, so we have to have a purpose for our life. So if we can help them find something purposeful in their lives, that helps them a lot to overcome depression. And slowly we can bring in the spiritual aspect to it. That actually you are an eternal indestructible being. Bad things have happened but you are bigger than your situations. You are bigger than your emotions. So therefore you don't have to be so affected by it. And then we can bring in Krishna. That actually whatever happens ultimately God is our well-wisher and he wants our best. So, if this has gone wrong, that has gone wrong, just focus on what is right and move forwards with that. So, what we are, God's blessing to us. What we become is, what we are is God's gift. What we become is our gift to God. So, we look at the good, some good things that are there in life, see what that is God's blessing and see what you can do. So, if we can somehow help them beyond that, that God exists and God cares. And even if bad things have happened, good can come out of that bad. Just focus on doing what you can. So we live in the present, but we don't live for the present. We live for Krishna in the present. How can I serve Krishna? How can I contribute in this particular situation? So when you focus on small things, okay, I can do this one thing, I can do this one thing, I can do this one thing. And gradually I just keep doing one thing, one thing. Yeah, I did so much, okay, that's good. I can do something and then we'll find slowly that depression will disappear. Okay? Thank you so much, Guru. Hare Krishna. Do we have time? Okay. Okay. Maybe one more. Hare Krishna, Guru. Thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. And I have a very small comment to say. Uh, particularly, I liked the example, sorry, the point you told that I to watch actions particularly driven by passion that will lead into uh, anti-climax. Uh, I was really thinking the actions of uh, Alexander the Great. He actually conquered the entire world by his passion. At the, the end, what happened is like uh, he has to die like grief. But at the same time, you know, like when Alexander died, he thought he conquered the entire world. But if you look at the actions of our founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada, like you know, his actions were like completely in transcendental and mode of goodness. And you look at what the end result we have now. Like he, you told, like every town, like in the village or in all over the world, we have beautiful temples and people, like you know, yes. yeah. So I was really comparing like it's beautiful, how, yeah, the beautiful energy. meditation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Shri Prabhupada Ki. Thank you. So Hare Krishna. So let's again thank Chris Chaitanya.